Uh, I was an apprentice plumber. Uh, I was in about a, my third year. It's a five-year course. And a lady by the name of Mrs. Seeger, whom I vaguely knew from the church, uh, came to see, ask to see me personally. Now, if you're an apprentice, there's not very many people come and ask to see you personally. Uh, and it was a bit of a joke that this old lady, and she'd be about 45 <laughs> at that time, but to us guys, she was old. And she wanted to see me, and all the other young guys were teasing me about all these, this old woman. And what she came, she said, look, I, the war had just finished. It was 1946. The men were coming back from the um, army. And they'd been away five years, some of them, and uh, their children had now grown and the wives had uh, matured and they'd had some experiences. And they were all put in at the barracks at the, uh, on the um, beachfront. And so what was military barracks was now family barracks, but they were living cheek by jowl. And the soldiers, the returned soldiers, were drinking heavily and there were fights and squabbles going on. But I was not aware of the background. But Mrs. Seeger came to see me personally, as she put it, and she said, I would like you to come and help me run a Sunday school on Sunday morning. And I thought, that, well, that was rather strange because she was high up, I thought, in the church and the ladies' guild or whatever it was. And I had asked previously if I could be a Sunday school teacher at the Full Gospel Tabernacle, and they said no because I was still playing sport and cricket and boxing, and I figured that wasn't a good thing for a Sunday school teacher. And uh, I thought, I, while she asked me if I'd go down to the army barracks, I thought to myself, well, what am I, if the church doesn't want me, what am I going to do with her? And the thought came to me, well, any opportunity is better than none. So I said, all right, I'll come. And we set the time, 9 o'clock, and I arrived. I had a little 15-horsepower French Citroen motor car. And I arrived there about five minutes to nine, and there'd be, there was like a, uh, a hall where the, some of the families had their dinner and their meal, and it'd been set up with some chairs and what have you, and there were about maybe 15, 20 children from about 12 years of age down to toddlers. Well, it's very hard to know what to do and what to talk about to those, but so what I, I, I always liked the story of David and Goliath, so I told that story, you know, about David and Goliath and what have you, and when it was over, a little gingerhead girl, about 10, walked up to me and said, will you come and pray for my daddy? And I thought, well, that'll be okay, I'll do that. So I said, yes, I'll come pray for your daddy. And then we walked through the, the barrack lines going down to where her family were, but the little girl was ahead of me slightly, hopping and skipping along and on the top of her voice saying, Jesus is going to heal my daddy, Jesus is going to heal my daddy all the way down, and after a while, something clicked. So I said to Mrs. Seeger, who was walking down alongside me, I said, what's the story? Why is everybody looking at us? She said, well, he's been rushed home from North Africa, so he in time to see his family because he's not expected to live. He's got uh, cancer, uh, they surprised he's even made it as long as he has. And I thought, oh, God, the first person I'm going to pray for is going to die, and I'm going to look a real Charlie here. It's amazing how you, you worry about how you are going to look. Anyway, we went in, and there was a fan. I can still see it now in the barracks. One fan swirling around half-heartedly, all the windows wide open, uh, quite a few people sitting around in the hot, humid atmosphere of a uh, summer morning in Durban. And in I walked with Mrs. Seeger and this little girl. And the little girl said to her dad, who was lying on a bed 
with just a thin white sheet over him. She said, Daddy, Uncle Bob has come to pray for you and Jesus is going to heal you. So I, I'd never prayed for a person really before and I wasn't too sure what to do, but I vaguely remember that Jesus put his, I always saw pictures with Jesus putting his hand on the head of somebody. So I walked up to the bed and I put my hand on his head and I said, uh, Jesus, will you please make this man better? Amen. That was my prayer. The little girl looked at me and said, what must daddy do now? And without thinking, it just came out. I said, daddy must get up and walk. And she said to her dad, daddy, you must get up now and walk. And then she began to pull the sheet away. And I nearly fainted. You could see all his ribs, all his bones. He, he was like a living skeleton. And his skin was so white that it, it, it was almost the color of that white sheet, I think. I, I was staggered, but they all helped this fella up. And he must have taken two feeble steps when he collapsed. And they put him back in bed. And I thought, well, that's that. You know, I won't go back to Sunday school down there, that's for sure. I'm not going to look at Charlie. But Mr. Seeger came on a Friday and said to me, uh, there'll be a lot more on um, this Sunday when you come down. I said, what do you mean a lot more? She said, well, the kids enjoyed your story and... Uh, they're all going to come, and I thought, well, I'll do it just for the children's sake. And when I got there at nine o'clock, there were, there was not just children, there was everybody. Half the barracks, I thought, must be in this place. And there was this man I'd prayed for, sitting in a cane chair, propped up with cushions and a blanket. But you, just looking at him, you can see he was different from when I prayed for him seven days ago. Something had happened. But the, the other thing that had happened was that the, uh, there wasn't just children. There were people. There were returned soldiers. There were parents. There were mothers. And, and what did I have? I hadn't prepared anything. So I just told the story again of David and Goliath. I mean, what else are you supposed to do? That's what I did. And then people just sat there and wanted me to pray for them. Well, after about two weeks of that or later, I got a phone call from the commandant in charge of the camp and he said, could I come and see him in his office? And I thought I was going to get a plumbing job and, uh, you know, impress the firm that I can go and get work, you know. Anyway, I went down there and met the commandant and he said, I don't know what you've done, he said, but he said, we've had nothing but fights, fights, fights. He said, but the last two weeks, since you've been here, all that turmoil has subsided. We've hardly had any unrest. He said, so I want you to come on a Wednesday night and we're going to give you the main hall. I said, what do you mean the main hall? He said, well, we've got a mess, you know, where all, everybody eats a big one. He said, and uh, my adjutant said that he thinks your influence is greater than the military police and all that goes with it. So the, I said, okay, me, oh, what do I know? I said, all right, I'll come along on Wednesday. But I knew I wasn't going to talk on David and Goliath. They'd had that twice, so I had to find something else. I needn't have worried, because when I got there on this Wednesday night, now remember, that would be about a month after I first prayed for him. Who was there in the front row but this fellow? He's looking thin, but Normal. Normal. And uh, he said he'd like to talk. Well, uh, Mrs. Seeger, she said, well, bring him up. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to do with him. And up he came onto the platform. There's a little platform they'd arranged. And he began to tell his story. That when we put our hands on his head, he said it was like a hot flush. Went up and down and up and down his body. And uh, he's now eating. He's not on drugs. They, they did a test, a cancer test. They could find nothing wrong with him. Everything's normal. They're telling him he's suffering from malnutrition and this now, and he's got to eat up and so on. And that was that meeting. 
One, and all I knew was, all those who want to meet God or divinity, as I used to call it in those days, uh, just come and we'll pray together. And half the barracks that were in the mess came forward. You think, well, that was wonderful. And Mrs. Seeger, she printed out, she's selling sewing machines. By the way, I must mention, Singer sewing machines were given to every family who got a husband back from the war. And the army or the military or the government gave them a, a, so many yards of suiting material so the woman could make the husband a suit. And you've got to remember those were old hand-moved things. So the more people that came, the more Mrs. Seeger could sell uh, her sewing machine. So the gospel and her business worked together, all right? And Trench was bang slap in the middle of this kind of confusion. Well, I suppose about the 6th, 7th, 8th Wednesday later, two fellows came to me, I think they were sergeants, if I remember correctly, and they said they've read in the Bible that they have to be baptized, and they are now believers, and they want to be baptized. Well, I don't have a church, I don't run a church, and uh, I don't baptize people. I thought you had to have a certificate and go to uh, be a minister to baptize people. So I went to the, the full gospel tabernacle and I said, look, there's a couple of people who want to be baptized. And the minister, the pastor, was very happy and he said to me, well, as it so happens, next Sunday we're baptizing three or four people from the church, so if you'd like to bring your friends along, uh, we'll baptize them as well. So that Wednesday, I go to the barracks and I told all those who want to be baptized by immersion, you've got to get to the church. But remember, the war was over. There was a, you couldn't buy a motor car. There was very little available. So the commandant, unbeknown to me, he says, well, I'll, we'll give you some army trucks to take you to the church. You can get baptized and the trucks will bring you back. Well, I thought there was two or four or five, six people. We filled up three army trucks. They arrived for the church. Now, you know, the, the military men are dressed in their military outfit. You got the wives who are, some want to be baptized, some don't. And you got all the children. The church could not hold everybody. It was packed. It was packed. The minister's so thrilled. I'm shocked. I mean, where are all these people coming from? They all want to be baptized. Well, I I don't know how Pastor Wooderson handled it, but and what he felt, but he just kept baptizing. First, he made sure he said, oh, "You know, you're born again." Do you know? Those are terms I never knew. I never used. I don't know religious terms. What I did know, this is how you get your sins forgiven. And they would tell him in the pool, "My sins are forgiven." That's what they knew, and he'd baptize them. And I think we baptized about 80 people that night. Something like that anyway. And we had a great, and that went on for six, seven months. Because they would move on, you know, go back to their little towns and all over South Africa. The next ship with the return soldiers would come. They'd go into the barracks and we would be waiting for them. It was quite an unusual thing. And I might as well say the other thing that was a problem. After that baptismal service, something changed in the church. I think it was envy and jealousy looking back 60 years later. They came to me and said, you don't have authority to run that thing. And I was not against that. I said, well, who does? Oh, it's got to be a deacon and an elder or something. So I said, well... Send him. So they sent two deacons and I handed it over to them. And you know what happened? Believe it or not, it went down the grade. They, they just didn't have it. I don't know what was wrong, but they just didn't have it. And the thing petered out. What happened was, because they represented the full gospel tabernacle, the Catholics were up in arms. Whereas I was a businessman. I didn't represent anything. So the Catholics then started their own. And then the Methodists, and then this one, and that one. And unfortunately, uh, it just folded up eventually because it just ended up little clicks. And that's that story.